Hello once again, AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record and Mr. Meunier here from Avon High School, talking to you a little bit about some area between curves that intersect at more than one point. That's our topic for e-learning day number seven on this Thursday, March 19th. Uh, we have a, what do you think, Mr. May? It's a pretty, pretty short stream, wouldn't you say, today? With just the one example? Yeah, I would think so, just one example. Yeah. Yeah, we've already talked a little Pretty bit about the example. Yeah, that is true. It does take a little bit of time, but uh, but we just have the one, and I think it's going to take care of all the different scenarios that you might be faced with that involve this little nuance. You know, if you've if you've had a chance to practice a little bit with the area between curves, I don't think that this is going to be much of a monkey wrench. I th I think that it's it's probably going to be very intuitive and it's it's very possible that we could have just foregone this example and you guys could have probably figured this out but we want to make sure that all of our bases are covered so uh, we will discuss uh, before the end of the stream the submissions for the homework and the quiz which both would be due at the end of the day tomorrow and then um, we're going to kind of maybe look a little bit long term I know many of you have probably already um, kind of been informed about how things will pick up when we come back from spring break. But we wanna talk about this little ongoing activity that you guys can start to look at that um, really starts to recap all of the ideas that uh, Mr. Meunier and I have taught you guys since the very end of July. Um, and then I think towards the end of the stream here today, we might talk a little bit about the plan that might be in place for taking advanced placement tests this year. It's all tentative right now, but... Um, that's pretty much what we've got on tap today. So uh, we'll uh, switch over to the problem here. Hopefully you've got that in front of you, the notes here from topic 8.6. Um, I'll go ahead and read this. It says, find the area of the regions bounded by the graphs of f of x equaling 3x to the third minus x squared minus 10x and g of x equaling negative x squared plus 2x. We wanna sketch the graph and we want to shade the region. So, it doesn't look like it's got a, a whole lot else going on with it. It probably reads a lot like the other problems that you've been seeing. But I think once we start to take a look at the graph, it's gonna be a little bit more apparent as to what's going on. So, what do you think, Mr. Meunier? What, what's the best strategy to go ahead and sketch this? Do you wanna talk through that while I, while I graph? Uh, I guess we just got to t-chart it. I mean, make a table, that or pull out your calculator if we had that available. <laughs> yeah, I would make a t-chart and maybe try to stick with what's on the picture now from negative three to three. Uh, as far as the X values, and I think that's going to get pretty darn large for the three just eyeballing the uh, F function because what negative three cubes, negative 27, that's a negative 81. Uh, going to be negative 90. It's going to be a negative 60. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. Way down here. Yeah. So that's way off the picture. But negative two, I think, is going to be a little better. We're going to get a uh, negative 24 uh, minus 4 plus 20, which will be a negative 8, I believe. Yeah, so that fits in our um, x, y axis. Would get a uh, negative 3 minus 1 plus 10, which would be a uh, negative 4. No, my bad. Negative 3, positive 6. Okay. I believe. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a big old zero. Thank goodness. And then one would be what? Three minus one minus 10 should be a negative eight, I think. 
think so, yeah. And two would be 24 minus four minus 20, which is gonna be zero again. And three is gonna be huge. It's not gonna fit, but what, what it's gonna be a 81 minus nine minus 20, which would give us 52. <laughs> so well off our particular sketch. Exactly. Exactly. And I guess it does help then, if the students. Yeah, we got a, a cubic looking function here. Yeah, just knowing that this is a cubic and you know, a lot of those things that sometimes we blow off from college algebra or, or pre-calc about the behavior of, of certain functions, you know, it kind of is helpful to, to remember that this cubic, because it starts with a positive coefficient, means it starts low and ends high. So it could look a little something like this. Yep. G of X is gonna be a little bit easier to graph, right? Yeah, it's going to be what an upside down. I believe so. And, you know, we could we could go ahead and t-chart this one just really quickly if we had to. I'll talk through this one if you don't mind. I gave Mr. Meunier the hard one. You guys see see how I operate there? <laughs> oh, negative three would be negative, uh, what, nine and then minus six. So that would be a three. So looks like we're up here, kind of running into my work. Uh, negative two would give us negative four minus four. So that would be a negative eight, which, oh, that's interesting. A little intersection there. Plugging in negative one, I get negative, negative one squared, which is negative one. Now remember that negative there doesn't get chewed up. Or, I'm sorry, the negative that's out in front here does not get kind of involved in that squaring process. So this would be minus one, minus two, which of course is negative three, which ooh, got a little scale change happening here, so I gotta be careful there. Zero does give us zero again, that will be good to know. And then for positive one, it looks like we have negative one plus two, which is positive one. For positive two, we'd have negative uh, four plus four which indicates that we're back to zero. And okay, I've done something wrong. <laughs> Isn't it negative nine or negative 15 for the first one? Uh, you're very, very possible here. Let's double check that. Negative nine minus six, yeah. This should be negative 15, everybody. This is not gonna look like a parabola after all. So we're way down here, right? We're way down there. All the other values I think are good. Uh, get to this positive three and I have negative nine plus six, which is negative three. Okay, so if I connect these red dots, I should have the graph of the G function and it's gonna look a little something like that. Okay, now do we see enclosed regions, because that's what this phrase means, right? Regions that are bounded, regions that are bounded. Do we see enclosed regions? And it turns out that we don't see just one, but we do see two enclosed regions, right? So we can shade those in. There are two of them. And I don't know, for the purpose of this video, maybe Mr. Meunier and I might decide to kind of number them. Maybe we'll put, you know, a, a one inside of the first one and a two inside of the second one to kind of denote region one, region two, and handle it like that. So Mr. Meunier, do you wanna, do you wanna lead us through the solution here, the setup? If we've got him, I know sometimes he has some 
internet issues. I think he's dropped from the stream. That's okay. He'll, he'll join us again. I'll go ahead and get us started here then. So what we've got going on is a couple of different areas. Okay. Um, on these two areas, we have to be very strategic about how these things get set up. So in other words, for the area of region one, um, we're definitely going to use an integral and we're going to use some boundaries. I think that kind of goes without saying, but you want to look very closely and see what kind of boundaries we have going on. And it looks like there's an intersection down here at negative two. Yeah, when the X is negative two, and then there's an intersection here when the X is zero. So we can use those as our boundaries, right? From negative two to zero. And then we just have to stick with our protocol that we take the top minus the bottom. So in this case, the top, and you know, Mr. Mene and I are you know, trying to use these colors for you so, to really let this pop, but it's very likely that you may not have that luxury in front of you guys all the time. So you have to make sure that you realize that this blue curve is that cubic graph. So we have three X cubed minus X squared minus 10 X as our top function. And then we'll subtract the bottom function. So it'll look a little like that and then with respect to X. And then I guess, what do you say, Mr. Mier? We probably clean this up a little bit would be our... Yeah, I'm back by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. No so, problem. we have, uh, I'm not, our internet did not drop out at all yesterday. It's like 11 o'clock Zoom session, I'm cursed. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's, just, it's just calc, right, yeah. Trig's, trig's yeah, going well. Yeah, I don't know. Trig and AP Lang yeah, are fine. Is, everything else is fine. <laughs> but it looks like we've got this simplified, okay? Is everybody in the stream agree with that? The X squared terms cancel out a little bit? And, uh, yep, I think we're good. Yep, and I, I guess we're gonna go ahead, Let's since we're only doing the one example, we'll go ahead and attack this by hand um, and, and we'll get that practice in, everyone. So uh, I'll finish this one up and we'll, we'll let Mr. Meunier talk through the second area. How's that? Um, so this three X cubed would integrate where the three just comes right straight down, right? And then the X to the third becomes X to the fourth. You add one to that exponent and place that same value in the denominator. And then the 12 will drop straight down along with the minus sign. And then we add one to the exponent and put that same exponent in the bottom. And I guess we catch a little bit of a break in this problem. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that are going on here, but it's, it's nice that we have a boundary of zero. And I think in Mr. Meunier's setup for region two, the same thing's going to happen. So if we do plug a zero in, it's pretty clear we're gonna get zero minus zero, right? Nothing to worry about there. Um, I guess here's the part that we gotta be a little extra careful about. When we plug in a negative two, well, don't forget, we still have three fourths, not much we can do about him, but then negative two to the fourth power would be a 16, a positive 16 at that. Drop down that minus, and then we have 12 over two, which is six, I'll just reduce that right now. And negative two squared, which would be positive four, would round out that particular result. And then I guess if we simplify this, um, we end up with negative quantity, Three fourths times 16, well, if we cancel the 16 and the four to get a four, that would give us a 12. And then we have a minus 24. And then of course, negative negative 12 would be a positive 12, which would be the area inside of this first yellow region. And before I turn it over to Mr. Meunier on part two of this area, I, I know some students, I, I got a few emails about regions that, that lie below the x-axis and how, we always construe those as being negative space. But you've gotta be kind of careful here. It's not the idea that that region has a negative area. It's the idea that the integral that defines that region takes on a negative value. So we're not saying for at any moment that there's negative space down here. 
what we just found with this number 12 is how big this first yellow shaded region is. Okay, and, and maybe if we get into some Q&A, uh, which is for the most part our, our agenda for tomorrow's stream, uh, we could start to emphasize that point just a little bit more. I, I just think some of my kids might be overthinking that. Basically, you let the integral do what it's designed to do, and that's that it will find area for you. So, okay, Ms. Mia, you wanna talk about the area of region two here? Yeah, no problem. Uh, I assume you found the, I, I dropped out, but you found the intersection points just by looking at the curve? Yeah, we have, we hadn't really talked about them, but they're, yeah, they're, um, in front of us, I guess, yeah. Yeah, that or, you know, we could always set the uh, functions equal to each other and solve to find those intersection points. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, a region two, clearly looks like our left edge uh, on the x-axis starts at zero and the uh, right side is at a positive two. So we wanna integrate from zero to two. On this one, our top curve is in red. That's our G problem. And we want to subtract out uh, the blue curve, which is our F problem. So it's going to have to be a uh, negative X squared plus 2X for the G problem. Subtract a uh, quantity of 3X cubed minus X squared minus 10X for our F problem. And that would be our... Um, Initial setup, uh, maybe clean that up. Um, if we combine some terms, it looks as though our x squareds are gonna cancel out. We're gonna have a negative three x cubed and um, negative negative 10 x would be a positive, so positive 12 x dx. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we have some quiz problems that might just be that's the answer choice. Um, get things set up and uh, we roll, simplify it down, combine like terms and circle the proper one. So that's not too bad. Now for us, you know, we, want, we want to finish this up. So let's integrate uh, negative three X cubed would be a negative three uh, add. So X to the fourth divided by the four uh, plus sign comes down, 12, um, we need to add, so x squared over two, um, and for uh, such that, put the two and the zero on the end. And then we roll, plug in your two, so it's gonna be a negative three, two to the fourth power is a 16 with the four underneath it. Uh, add on, uh, 12 and two is a six, we can clean that up. Two squared is gonna be a four. And that's the uh, first group, subtract out. Thankfully we have a zero here. So zero plus zero. Uh, from there, uh, 16 and four is a four times a negative three is a negative 12 plus a 24 uh, minus zero gives us a 12. So we're looking at region area, region two there's a 12. Uh, region one was also 12. So the area all together is gonna give you 12 and 12 is a uh, 24. Yep. We've used this example for many years and I think we always kind of chuckle that, that these two regions have the same exact area, which is just a coincidence. Um, they're certainly not the same shape. You wouldn't call these similar shapes, right? From a geometric standpoint. Um, I don't even know, can we call them congruent shapes? I mean, they might have the same area, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're congruent, but they certainly are the same size, that's for sure. And um, it, it's, I already had somebody send me a private message about, you know, are we responsible for having to graph things that are this complicated? And I'd almost say to an extent, no. I think this, this really pushes the, the extreme of, of 
of your responsibility, I think, to sketch these. But I think that we would all agree that we certainly relied very heavily on this sketch um, because it really helped us determine, first of all, that we needed two integrals, okay? And, and there is really no way that any of us can get the correct answer if we don't use two integrals. If we just assume that, oh, you can just take f of x minus g of x or g minus f and integrate from negative two to two, in fact, that would be kind of an interesting um, scenario. I don't know if, if Mr. Mignane, I necessarily want to display that to you here, but it's a great extension for this problem. Take your graphing calculator and, and just integrate f minus g from negative two to positive two. And uh, it'll be very interesting what you get. It certainly won't be 24. So this idea of really paying close attention to what function is on top over what functions on bottom is very, very important. And um, there's a question in the homework, um, number six, I believe, that was really assigned as part of um, the first night's homework that actually might have a little bit more to do with this idea. And, and so maybe when you go back and practice this afternoon um, or on into tomorrow, you can look at that number six and think about our discussion here. Um, I wanted to show you something here. I'm gonna drag the calculator in. Here's what the sketch would have looked like this. I, I guess let's say that we really wanted to rely on the calculator to, to figure out what's happening here. Um, the problem with that is that if you if you invoke the calculator use too much, then the calculator can do a lot for us. And um, it's very likely, well, it's 100% likely that on a normal year on the AP exam, that this question would, would be on the non-calculator part. And the reason is because you've got a feature on your calculator. If you go into menu, and you choose option six, analyze graph, there is this very cool thing called bounded area. And this bounded area is really what takes care of a lot of the problems that Mr. Meunier and I have talked about in topic eight, four to eight, six. So to access this, you click on it and it just asks you a few questions. If you only have two curves on your screen, it will assume <clears throat> that you're finding the area between those two now, if there was a third curve on your screen, it would ask you what your first curve is and what your second curve is. So you would just click on them one at a time. But if we just go ahead and slide this over and it'll sort of lock into where this first intersection point is. So we can hit our enter button and then you can start to see as we move to the right, it's just accumulating area. It's accumulating this area. Now, I want you to pay real close attention by the time we get to the zero, it's got that area of value, oops, up here, that's, that's 12, which is exactly what we computed. But do you see as we continue to sweep to the right, even though we're seeing area that predominantly, or space, I should say, that, that lies below the x-axis, our total accumulated area is still climbing, right? We're taking care of all of this area by treating it as positive space. And of course, once we get to that intersection point, there's our answer that we expected to get. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, you're like, oh boy, this is a pretty cool thing. Uh, we're gonna take a quiz here online where we can use the calculator, and yeah, you could. Uh, as Mr. Meunier said though, many of the problems are just going to ask you to set up, just set up the integrals that are needed to find the area. Now, in the event that the question does ask you to actually compute the area, Let's make sure that we're showing our work. Keep that sheet of paper handy in case we just might want to grab that from you when we get back to school. Um, but I, I, I certainly don't think that this is a bad tool for you guys to use to check answers. But please understand that there's, there's so much more to this lesson than just finding area, you guys. You're, you're able to work out any kinks, any rusty parts about your ability to integrate. You're also able to kind of exercise your knowledge of the fundamental theorem of calculus, plugging in those boundaries and subtracting. And to be honest, we've seen a lot of really creepy expressions where we had to like combine like terms with fractions. Didn't 
happen so much with this particular problem, but many of the ones that we'd seen earlier in the week were like that. So you really get to work on a lot of things and you don't have to do it so much under a huge umbrella of busy work. I don't think that the assignment, you know, we've assigned 13 problems and you've had pretty much a whole week to do them. So um, we hope that that, uh, that is like working for you and you're able to see yourself get better and better and better. So. Uh, Jason asked a really good question here. If you shift the cubic function up, area one would be larger and area two would shrink. I would have to agree with that. And you know what? I, let's, I want to take a look at something here. If I were to click on this cubic function, what if I shift it up? Uh, anybody got a number you want me to shift it up? How about, let's not shift it up a whole lot. How about just one unit? Is this area all dynamic? It is. You see how it still is computing the area, 24.1. If I were to make this number even bigger, let's go up to four. Now the area becomes 26. Oh, that'd be a nice one, Mr. Meunier. <laughs> that would be a, a good one to throw yep. in there because it has a nice result. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, because um, Sierra had asked prior to Jason, would both areas always be equal? And yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the functions and, and what they're doing and how they're interacting. Um, so that's a great sort of extension as well. There's a lot of neat things that 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 one can kind of uh, uh, think about when you're dealing with area between curves like this. So and I think you guys would agree if I go back to the notes here, there's really no point in us throwing other examples at you because they're all really the same. Um, I know that Mr. Mooney talked about, well, what if we didn't know what these points of intersection were? Well, it's really not the end of the world because you could solve these two equations set equal to each other pretty easy. And I know that initially it's a little scary because you're thinking, oh, no, no, this has got a cubic in it. But if you were to get all these terms on one side, so let's say if I added x squared, we'd see those cancel the minus the, the 2x would subtract over from this negative 10x and be negative 12x. And then lo and behold, you're like, wow, that's a pretty easy equation to deal with, right? We could just factor out a 3x. That of course leaves us with x squared minus four. And then hopefully you guys can see that the solution here would include a zero and both a positive and a negative two, which is exactly what we saw graphically. But if you're like me, without the graph, I really will have a hard time telling which function was on top and which function was on bottom, okay? Um, but rest assured, if, if you end up having a really horrid, horrid pair of functions, it's very likely that the sketch might already be provided for you on, on an AP exam or say a test that Mr. Meunier and I would write. So I think that probably takes care of this stuff, right? Right. Now remember, if you've got any questions over the skill builder so far, that's going to be the focus of tomorrow's stream. And uh, we'll definitely take care of you there. And then um, the submission for the Schoology assignment is, it's up and live, I think, right now. It is res resumable. Yep. But it is a one-time submission, so you, you probably are, you know, want to still hold off on that. And we would completely understand um, before you actually make the submission. And Mr. Renee, again, he wrote a really cool one where he has like some matching. Uh, he's broken it up into different sections, and it's sort of like a matching version of our homework. So, uh, and then the quiz is due tomorrow night at midnight. That doesn't mean that you have to start it at 11.25, you guys. You can actually do it before. <laughs> um, you know, I, you, you, we, don't, we don't have it up and ready yet, uh, and we probably won't until maybe after tomorrow's stream. But, uh, you know, hopefully during the afternoon tomorrow you can take care of that, so. Um, Jason, you asked a great question, and I'll tell you what, we will address that. I might end the recording, and I'll uh, address that with you guys uh, here in just a moment, but uh, hold off on that question. We'll definitely address that. Um, hey, real quickly, shall we discuss this journey through calculus A to Z? I'm gonna drag that in. Now, Mr. Meunier and I haven't completely decided about 
how this could be implemented, but we're, we're discussing the idea of, of, of providing you an opportunity over not just the two week spring break, but even the week after to practice some of the problems that we've, we've been teaching over the past several, several months. And this is a really neat worksheet that again was designed by our friend uh, from Speedway. And it, it's called a journey through calculus from A to Z, which you can see that you're provided, uh, you know, a graphical representation of a function and it's actually a derivative of F, a piecewise definition of H, and then a graphical, or I'm sorry, a tabular representation of a function G's second derivative. And just based on these three things, 26 different questions from A to Z can be asked that deal with topics way back from the beginning of the year and progressively move towards the middle of the year and on to the end of the year. They're not exactly written in chronological order, but they come fairly close. Uh, obviously, here's something that we just talked about, finding the average rate of change, right? You could also think of that as back a long ago, just try taking the, the change in H, um, over the change in, in X. And it's progressively gonna grow. There's your Riemann sums. There's your definite integral fundamental theorem. On each page, you can see that the F prime, the H and the G double prime are copied and pasted again. And, and as, of, as of now, as of where we stand, you can answer every single one of these questions. There's a rate in, rate out problem, guys. Every one of these questions, I might have to format this to get this table to show up better, but every one of these can be answered with the exception of Z. <laughs> Z is the only thing that we're holding off on because you're asked to find this, this volume here. Uh, y is really what we've just covered, finding the area bounded by the graphs. So this is something that we'll probably post on our Schoology page uh, perhaps tomorrow, and it's something that you guys can work through and keep yourself busy with. Um, and you know, we would set a due date for it way down the road, but any kind of work that you could do on this prior to would, would, would certainly be of a benefit. Um, what, what Mr. Minier and I have always done in the past is over spring break, we, we used to administer our, our first mock exam. And the, the problem with that is that we can't get that out to you, obviously. It's, it, would, it would come in the form of a very large packet. And we just don't want to coordinate trying to hand deliver that and, and whatnot. But we can still do some review. And we thought that this might be a great way to facilitate that. So I hope that you don't look at this as like, oh, great, more stuff to do. What are you doing? It's our spring break. We Trust me, we want you to enjoy the spring break. Enjoy it with your family. I, I know a lot of you are already bummed out and depressed because of the fact that you can't necessarily travel anywhere. But for those of you who don't mind doing a little bit of, of work to kind of uh, catch up, we'll certainly uh, make that option available. So, and, and we've already discussed the possibility of continuing to do some, some Zoom lessons that would not be required, that would not have a homework attached to it or not a grade in the grade book attached. But for those of you who, who want to keep sharp and, and, and keep um, you know, your, your memory of calculus still alive as we head into what potentially could be an altered form of the advanced placement test. So, all right. So tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we can take any other individual questions here. But we, we, we thank everyone that's uh, joining us asynchronous from our particular uh, e-learning day seven. And we look forward to seeing you guys next time.